All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, today we have Lena, with us Lena from EOS Data Analytics. Uh, Lena is gonna be providing us a presentation on yield forecasting as a key to sustainable use of fertilizers. Lena, over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, so apologies for being a bit late. Um, yeah, I can start, right? So just yeah. start. Yeah, perfect. So uh, this is this is the first time like we are doing a conference from uh, farms.com uh, conference and especially online. And I'm going to continue speaking about space and agriculture as Eric did yesterday from Canadian Space, space Agency. So if you haven't seen his performance, please like join afterwards. Now I'm going to share my screen and show you the slides. Here we go. So this is this is the first time my team and I are attending this this conference and a few words about like our company. So EOS Data Analytics is a part of the Nosphere venture space projects. All companies that you can see here, they are somehow related to space, uh, to the space industry, like uh, producing small vehicles for rockets. And EOS is a global provider of satellite imagery and uh, satellite uh, analytics based on the imagery. And uh, we apply uh, these insights to mining, oil and gas, and military. However, like our main expertise is agriculture till now. EOS has its own team of scientists, R&D team that makes us totally independent in terms of development and research. And um, we have our own satellite, we have developed our own satellite crop monitoring product that works out of box and continue to build our expertise about like yield prediction, uh, crop type, differentiation from uh, from space land cover classification. We're going to launch uh, our own multispectral satellite uh, constellation and have already signed an agreement with Dragonfly Aerospace that is going to deliver it to the orbit in 2022. And this is really exciting for us because it's new opportunities, higher, like super high resolution imagery for uh, agriculture and other industries. So let's start from something pleasant from uh, from a glass of wine. So I don't know I don't know exactly what it is, but it may presume that it's Chardonnay or Riesling. And these species of grape require a combination of low yield and phenolic ripeness. Phenolic ripeness, this is something that gives like perfect balance of sugar, acid, and tennis that makes this wine really special. Other words, if you put this kind of grape uh, into overly fertile soil in warm client, it will just lose its character that makes this wine so recognizable. And uh, in this regard, like uh, the regions that uh, like the originally were suitable for this wine, they are getting warmer and uh, the regions that were historically not suitable for this wine in England and Norway, they're becoming suitable because the climate changes and uh, some well-known companies from uh, Champagne, they buy a new lands in England and Norway uh, for, for, their, uh, for, for their vineyards. Why do you need this information? There are two reasons why you need it. First of all, like uh, you can safely buy British wine, uh, fine wine and uh, sparkling wine. So it's just perfect and not so expanding, expensive as French because climate changes and we can drink British, Norway uh, and Norway wine. And the second reason, this is like climate change. I know that everybody's talking about that. And uh, climate change, this is something that applies to everyone like who's listening to this presentation and, and attending it. And it's not only about wine. Uh, researchers of the International Food Policy Research Institute, that uh, they uh, say that sustain suitable crop lands for two major crops like corn, potatoes, rice, 
and weed, they're going to shift by 2015, by, by 2050. And in some cases, it will push farmers, you know, to change uh, and uh, plant new crops. Uh, some farms, they may benefit from, from the warming and some plants, they may, like, they may not. And what it says, it, it actually says that the global production of corn will decrease by 24% by, 20, by 2050. And uh, so these areas, the orange one, this is the areas where uh, production, global production of these major crops will drop uh, by like, will, will, like, will be less than five, will be greater than 5%. So, and, and not like global warming, climate change is not so scary for wheat and potato, but what it means it, for all of us, it means that only those uh, become like, winners if they modernize their methods in, and diversify their fields. And if they learn how to adjust to the climate, the changes and minimize their risk, the only way here is to predict future and predict these possible risks. And that's where yield prediction and crop modeling systems come in handy. Originally, those systems, you might have heard of BOFOS and DSSAT, they are aimed to help farmers to make decisions easier and first of all, cheaper. And uh, that's something that allows to, incre to increase yield. And uh, yield prediction, um, like companies uh, nowadays, they have been working on putting yield prediction into action, into practical way. And yield prediction actually can answer the following questions that are important for uh, farmers and seed producers. For example, what crops are more efficient to produce considering climate shift in, in 10 years, in 50 years, especially as applicable for multi-year crops? And what is the reasonable amount of fertilizers to use to gain highest productivity and also considering uh, plants consuming capacity and uh, how to predict like the performances of new hybrids in virus environments to breed for better varieties, not just doing you know, testing and waiting several se seasons when you have results to apply them. So uh, yeah, and that's something EOS data analytics is working on. Currently, we are uh, trying to apply these technologies, for crop, uh, crop simulation technologies for building various scenarios and make it possible for farmers, like doing this on the far, at the farm level, at the field level, uh, to look in, into the future and know that climate uh, and, and understand how climate change will impact. And, uh, I'll give you like an idea what stands behind actionable, actionable recommendations and modeling itself. So, uh, and hope that the next year we'll meet here and we'll be presenting, you know, a uh, success story with the client from Canada and real cases. So the tasks that we are solving at the moment are the following. First of all, this is for Castile with um, with plus 80% accuracy at the field level and the farm level levels. So reach 80, even 90% accuracy at the province or a region or country level, that, that's quite easy. The more difficult task is to do that with uh, field level. And another thing like provide uh, recommendations, uh, fertilizer recommendations based on this prediction for 2022, uh, for 2021, uh, yes, to reach highest possible yield using yield modeling. And uh, challenges that stand behind those tasks are the following. Uh, lower, we get, we get like lower accuracy and correlation with actual yield at the field scale. And it's actually obvious because uh, because of lacking historical statistic and we have low spatial variability of weather data it means if your fields are located in the same blocks 
weather stations are showing the same weather and yield prediction systems, they are based on weather, uh, on, on weather statistical data. Another thing, uh, the challenge is like, when we switched to Canada and started doing uh, checking um, yield prediction for fields there, we spotted that the fields actually have lakes and trees inside. And it's not so easy, you know, to, to see, uh, to understand the vegetation, the actual uh, vegetation of crops from space when you have a lot of other objects there in, in front of the field. And uh, I'm going to switch to the next slide and tell you how are we solving those challenges to reach the goals. Yeah, so first challenge, as I mentioned, this is like low accuracy at the field scale. So uh, previously we worked at the province scale, at region and country scale. We were doing several projects for Brazil government, Ukrainian government, and they were at the, like, at the country scale. So, uh, and we were getting up to 90% accuracy. But then when we worked with one agri holding, they were interested to get yield modeling for every field. And here we got this obstacle, like more uh, than 30% of fields, they were showing accuracy less, lower than 80%. And the green fields, those, the fields that show like more than 80% accuracy. And we noticed that those fields that are having uh, like heterogeneous vegetation, you know, like different vegetation values uh, in different zones, like we were, we consider LAI, like the proxy biomass for that, not in DVI, uh, for modeling, they are showing this low, uh, this low variation of values at the field level and they are showing low uh, accuracy with the actual yield. And we understood, and also, the problem that we have here, this is like lack of uh, historical statistics, lack of management data that uh, crop modeling system require to have. And we understand that without this space data, uh, vegetation data from space, the actual state of the crop we won't be able to move forward. So uh, that's why EOS, um, yeah, I'm sorry about the quality, it's different a bit. Uh, EOS has developed its own uh, approach to that using world known practice. And uh, so in predict when predicting yield, we, um, we include soil, weather, uh, soil type, weather, crop phenol uh, phenology there. And also uh, this model, this engine, it builds you a variety of possible scenarios. So you can see them here. And then adding on top some satellite data at every stage of crop development, we are able to narrow down these scenarios to one like more likely that it, uh, the, the possible one. And it helps us to predict uh, this, uh, like they call it LAI assimilation. It allows us to uh, reach like 80% of accuracy at the country level and uh, sometimes 90% of accuracy at the country level and 80, more than 80% for some field at the uh, field level. So uh, what we are doing, so we are dividing field into several productivity zones, you know, in order not to take just the average vegetation index for the whole field in order to understand its heterogeneity and include it into the model to like, to predict more accurately. And then uh, we include uh, these values for different zones of the field into prediction models. And this allowed us to uh, improve the accuracy for like uh, almost like 80% of the fields from those 20, from those 30 ones that have like lower accuracy and reach uh, uh, 80 percent uh, and more accuracy for fields that were showing worse results uh, without LEI assimilation. So uh, understanding that we're that we have 
these good results, uh, we moved to Canada, like checking this model, how, how it will work out there in Canada. Um, and uh, at the, yeah, just a sec. Yeah, so first we started doing it at the province scale. We run, we calibrated the model and ran it based on the official statistics that is perfectly set uh, in, in the open access so everyone can reach it. That's not the same in, in Brazil or in uh, Eastern European countries where we did a real prediction. So this is great. And we took soil maps, we took phenology and calculated optimal sowing days for that and took statistics. And um, we got, like we, we uh, we got results for three, three provinces, like Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. And the results that we got at the province level, 91% of accuracy for Manitoba and Alberta for wheat, 80, uh, 89 for barley and 80 for canola. The worst values showed uh, Saskatchewan, and this is also the point you know, to research further uh, in this, uh, in this state. However, since, the, since we understood that the model at the province level worked correctly, we went down like to the, to the field scale. And that's what I mentioned. That's what we have noticed, like trees, uh, trees and lakes inside of fields. And also we, we, couldn't, we didn't have shape files, you know, for, for the crop butter. So we had to apply the technology like land cover classification technology and crop age detection. So we differentiated lakes and trees from the actual water automatically and detected the ages, the ages of the actual crop in order not to spoil LEI and put right values into the uh, modeling. And for 2019, uh, we got like 87% of accuracy for soybean, 82% of accuracy for corn, and 76% of accuracy for canola. This is like canola showed the worst results. So that's why we're going to proceed and uh, run the model for 2020, 20, since we have reliable statistics for 2019, and it should improve actually the values. So this first step for correct and accurate yield prediction is actually a, a key for the right and correct recommendations, um, uh, correct recommendations for uh, fertilizer use that, and uh, that's what, what we did next. Like we uh, modeled, modeled the influence of fertilizers. So you can see uh, the green curve shows the yield performance with applying fertilizers and the red one shows without applying fertilizers. You can see that both yield curves are growing till about day 110 and then they start to diverge. And the soil, like that's obvious because the soil itself has some uh, some useful micro, ele micro elements that helps to uh, the crop um, develop like itself till, till some moment. So, and what takeaways we can take from, from the modeling? First of all, this is, uh, you can see that the green curve keeps on growing. When red reached its plateau on the 110th, and it actually means if the crop uh, keeps developing, the green, the yield actually will be growing. And it means that if you have frost resistant hybrid or hybrid with quicker ripening, uh, this is the way to higher yields. And this answers the question, how it helps seed producing companies without like waiting for several season, seasons of tasting, understand what, uh, how their hybrids can perform. This also, of course, it requires and soil sampling, uh, laboratory data, and uh, previous historical um, development of 
like previous hybrids that we had to include them in the model and see how they react to the weather conditions. But still, like modeling can save money for testing and you can uh, build different scenarios and varieties. And here we've presented, you know, uh, NPNK um, graphs to show how yield is growing based on adding these fertilizers into the soil. So the Y axis, this is yield. And uh, here are like blue, uh, blue and green curves, those are kilograms. Those are kilograms per hectare applied there. So the takeaways that we can, uh, outcomes that we can see from here. So you can see that uh, green, green curve and the light green and the blue one and like one which is not so green, uh, they are pretty much the same. So it actually doesn't make, uh, so it actually means that you should um, apply optimal amount of fertilizers, applying 30, 35 kilograms per hectare doesn't make sense because the crop consuming capacity is, is lower and it's something that can save your money when you know how much fertilizers you can apply. And of course, we understand that every agronomist knows, knows their field and they know how much uh, fertilizers uh, like require this field requires, but when you have hundreds, thousands of fields, this is the way to uh, apply crop modeling in order to see uh, what's possible scenarios you can you can have out of that. Uh, yeah, yes, and also the possible outcome is that you can run modeling in the middle of the season when you see that the weather can unpredictably change and there is a threat of droughts, of floods, you can run the model uh, just to model how much fertilizers do you need with these worse uh, weather conditions to reach some optimal level of yield. So this is something um, that's what like crop modeling and simulation system are about. And he, we here in EOS, we believe into, like we are supporting the idea of virtual farms of, uh, so every farmer should have its virtual farm and uh, that will solve the problem of data discrepancy among different platforms that will combine the data from different sources like weather, soil sampling data, crop chronology, management, like management, uh, field management data from previous years. And uh, based on that, we'll show you possible scenarios. And that's what we are working on, on this universal platform where you can just uh, on click build different scenarios and get the answers to the previous questions. And yes, this is like pilots that use simulation firms, you know, to decrease possible risks in the future. The same will do uh, virtual farms and virtual fields that will simulate scenarios and help make better uh, decision out of box. So yeah, this is just a quick overview. Sorry for taking your time and uh, of what we are doing here in EOS. Please uh, ask questions if we have time, of course, and visit our, our booth um, if you want to talk and just mail us. Yeah. Okay, what a, that's it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Lena. That was very interesting. Um, it was kind of surprising to learn that uh, Canadian geography uh, with our lakes and trees uh, would provide such a challenge <laughs> to forecasting. <laughs> I was surprised for us, actually. <laughs> yes, well, I guess it makes sense, but it, it is a surprise to learn that we'd be different from that perspective. So that was very interesting. Um, when you're talking about the um, uh, the last slide there where, where you were talking about the, it's not virtual farms, that's not the term you used and I can't think of the term that you used. Um, uh, the, the very last slide that you had with- Simulation? Yeah, with the simulations. So are you thinking like game simulations or are you thinking simulations where farmers would, um, you know, put in different variables and then see the results? Yes, that, that's right. Just 
putting different variables and uh, having this complicated machine learning, like on the machine learning technologies on the back end, and considering like the scientific background that is already on the market, uh, they can predict different scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Um, we do have to wrap up because we have another session in just a few minutes. So sorry, Lena. Um, so we will wrap up everybody. As Lena noted, um, they do have a booth and you can visit their booth if you have more questions. Uh, you can also reach out to Lena via chat, if you will, uh, in the feedback platform and they'll be sure to answer there as well. So sorry, everybody to cut it short, but we'll end this session. And the next session is at 11.40, and it is the promise of Decision Ag delivered smarter equipment and better decisions. Thanks cool. for- Thank you everyone. Yeah, for your attention. Bye.